Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Product in LA podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Cole, and this is an opportunity to shine the spotlight on some of the exceptional technology leaders we have as part of the LA community. With us today is Chris Chene. Super excited to have you here, Chris. Thank you for having me. Oh, man, this is going to be a really interesting episode. Stick around, folks. You'll, you'll see why in a second. But first, a word from our sponsors. Product in LA is brought to you by Uruit. Do you need help completing your roadmap items? Uruit is a digital product development agency with over 15 years of experience helping U.S.-based companies build web and mobile apps by embedding directly into their Scrum teams. Uruit's expert full-stack software developers provide quality code to help you get the job done. If you need React or Angular front-end devs, or perhaps help with Node.js, .NET, or Python development, DevOps, or even product or design help to solidify requirements, they're ready to help you close out features and actually release updates to customers. Learn more at uruit.com. That's U-R-U-I-T.com. We're also brought to you by the Product Managers Association Los Angeles, available at pma.la. They are LA's largest professional organization for product and designers in LA. With more than 3,000 members from over 500 companies, they host monthly meetups, organize product leader councils where the CPOs and heads of product connect in small six to eight member pods and have a mentorship program where they connect working product managers with students from underrepresented groups to help build a better and more diverse next gen. To learn more about PMA, go to pma.la. To learn more about the mentorship program, go to pma.la slash mentorship. Our guest today is Chris Chene. His present role is the Senior Technical Advisor to the Deputy Chief Information Officer at the LA Homeless Services Authority. His past roles include, have included Manager for Performance Management at the LA Homeless Services Authority and a Social Work Associate at Children's Hospital of LA. And one interesting fact you might learn about him by going to his LinkedIn page is he's the, on the Leadership Council for LA Tech for Good. Chris, do you want to tell us a little bit about that organization? Yeah, most definitely. So LA Tech for Good is a great nonprofit. Uh, we work with a lot of agencies and a lot of folks to train staff and anyone who wants to come uh, on how to use data and equity together. And we're looking at, you know, how to way, how to, to not only look at for the data practitioner, but the ability to use data to translate and do a lot of storytelling and really make a really impactful message when it comes to looking at equity and data at the same time. Wow. So it's, it's looking, it's using, you know, the concept of trying to be inclusive and diverse and, and paying attention to diversity in the data analysis itself. Most definitely. Cause that's one of the things that a lot of times, you know, gets left out when we do a data analysis or like huge, yeah. huge, a lot of, a lot of folks look at, Oh, I like data. Here's the breakdown of demographics, but they're not really using data to inform a lot of decision-making when it comes to equity. So this is an organization that we try to help agencies and teach them how to use data to help inform their decision-making. That's awesome. Yeah. And just thinking it through, you know, there's such an emphasis to use data to help drive decisions, but the, the attention that's being paid to how you're collecting it is one thing that people are starting to do, but also how are you analyzing it? How are you using your own biases and institutional biases to, to help. Exactly. That's it. It's, that's a terrific organization. And, uh, I believe, it, uh, the PMA LA is working on an upcoming event. Um, I believe that's going to be in the June, 2023 timeframe. So, uh, keep an eye out for, for that event, LA tech for good and PMA LA. Awesome, Chris. Well, I'm really excited to chat with you. Um, your background is, is really an, an, an interesting problem set and, the the, relationship between technology and the LA housing problems, uh, you know, the homelessness issues, uh, something I'd really want to dive into, but first I want to get back to the beginning, you know, what was your journey like into technology? Is this something that you, it was a straight path you saw coming all along, you know, how did you find your way into helping attack or approach the LA housing issue using, you know, data and technology. Yeah. I'm a, <laughs> so my, my path to technology is an interesting one. Okay. I haven't even, I didn't even have a computer in my house until I was 20. So until you're 20. Like, yeah. So I didn't even grow up with a computer. Like wow. I grew up like, you know, going to, you know, going to libraries and doing homework and a bunch of other stuff like that. Yeah. But I know cell phones, like this is pre, this is pre smartphones. Yeah. Just about, <laughs> just about pre cell phones and pre everything technology. Wow. So it was weird. Cause I didn't, I didn't, 
plan for technology. And, and it sounds like a lot of people who fall into the product management space are, are in the similar track. Like they didn't plan to get in this space. Right. So I, you know, I started off my career going into uh, water technology, which is okay. more about like water distribution and water treatment. And I was getting my contractor's license, my class. I like, I had a whole nother track and okay. I was like, this is where I'm going to go. And then I was like, you know what? I don't like doing this after working on it for a couple of years. So I was like, you know, I'm going to switch up and go back to school. So I did social work. I loved it. Social work was fantastic. As a, as a working social worker. Yeah. So like, well, I went to school to get my social work and I was doing, I was doing like, uh, there's something between like micro and macro social work, right? Like, so the micro is like the therapy, the counseling. I realized fast that I wasn't a fan of that type of like uh, social work, but okay. I was a fan of macro social work, which was very about about like policy and advocacy and trying to figure out how to make solutions better for folks from a systemic point of view. Okay. So I was like, okay, I love this. And then I started diving into it a little bit more. I got an internship with like the you know, state senator's office. I, I started working at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, which which made me enter the technology field in a way that I never saw coming. So we were trying to figure out a way that we can do like marketing and enhance our marketing capabilities to a specific demographic that we were trying to work with, you know, young what would, fathers. What would that look like? Yeah, what were you trying to market to them? Just the program itself, it's trying to be like, okay, so where can we find a lot of fa young fathers? Because that was the program that we were working at at the time. So young fathers to try to help them with like a parenting and healthy relationships and get them also connected to social support services and housing as well. Okay. Um, but we were like, okay, so we need to get a lot more people into this program. So I started playing around with ArcGIS and trying to develop like layers and like, okay, so where are there a lot of folks within like, uh, you know, young fathers, young parents, and, and trying to figure out if there's a way that I can figure something out. And that, we, we did it. We, we were able to develop a bunch of, uh, geo, uh, spatial layers and be like, okay, we need to coordinate here. We need to coordinate there in Los Angeles County. We need to coordinate here. And we we're like, okay. And it blew up. We were able to bring in a lot more parents, a lot more fathers into the program. Was that based on like census information? Or exactly. What? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we were able to bring in census tract information where we would pull in different layers from other communities and trying to figure out a little bit more in depth um, information. So that really took off. And then we were like, okay, so now that we did this, what other technology based thing can we do? So we started working with a lot of organizations, like there's an organization in LA called Human IT, which we started partnering with and started coordinating with. And then we also uh, try to teach the the folks within the program a little bit more of like, how do how do or do applications like simple, like how to do applications, but a lot of the applications at the time were like well, web based. Right. So trying to like do a little bit more of like computer literacy and data literacy and trying to do that as well, all within children's hospital. And then after uh, Children's Hospital, I went to uh, Lhasa. Uh, that was a huge shift. And this, this is the LA Housing, uh, the LA Homeless Services, Homeless Authority. Services Authority. Yeah. yeah. So once we, I went into Lhasa, I realized that there's a lot that technology can play to help benefit um, when it comes to everyone, the case manager themselves and the work and operations that we can do to enhance the work that we were trying to do within the community. Um, so a lot of that work really was like, okay, where's the deficit? So a deficit, like a simple deficit was, you know, a lot of people were trying to develop an FMR calculator, calculator, fair market rent calculator, AMI calculator, area median income calculator, where they were trying to identify eligibility for clients. But then when I, I said, all right, everybody send me those sheets. A lot of the calculations were different. A lot of every, a lot of things were different. I was like, okay, so we need to figure out a streamlined way to do it. So we developed, for, and what was the problem you were trying to solve there? Yeah. So we were trying, cause there's eligibility requirements for housing uh, subsidies and resources okay. uh, based so off of so people who, so, so people with house, with some sort of housing, but maybe not enough housing. Well, people that are experiencing homelessness that need housing. So there's certain okay. housing resources that are available if they're below 30% AMI. And then there's certain resources that were available to them if they were below 50% AMI. And what, um, what, what's AMI? Uh, area median income. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I think you're blowing my mind a little bit. So I, again, this is, this is just coming from uh, a place of not, not really understanding the problem, I guess, not even enough. So there's different tiers of homelessness that you guys are looking into and, and through the different tiers at of the, the time. Okay. Yeah. At the time. Cause like re there were, we were really resource thin at the time okay. when we first started. Um, and that was before quite a few measures passed to actually expand, um, how, how, many resources came into Los Angeles for homeless services. So you were, you were bootstrapped and in order to solve, to help with the bootstrapping, you were taking this, this segment of the population, you know, the, you know, 
you know, most people would just like look at, okay, it's one, it's homeless, it's one big block. But in order to make better use of your resources, you actually tiered that into different little, you know, sub segments. So you could really approach the, the people who need it the most, or I guess it would be the people who need it the most, or was it the people who were most likely to use it? I think at the time it was mainly about eligibility. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily about vulnerability. Vulnerability had a scale, but everyone was experiencing homelessness. So it was more so about eligibility. We're, you know, there's a lot of folks in the homeless space and people that are experiencing homelessness do ha- do work. Um, so a lot of a lot of folks uh, may not qualify for certain benefits, and some folks may qualify for others. Wow. Um, so in this in this uh, in this problem, we were trying like, okay, how can we centralize it? How can we develop a tool? that all the case managers can use within the community to uh, go to a central place, put in the client's information and spit out, like, are they eligible for these resources? Or are they eligible for these resources? So we built that out. It was my first like, okay, web-based application, like trying to build that out and like, oh, it was so dope. <laughs> and, 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 like a lot of people liked it, you know? And then uh, during my time at LASA, we built a lot of those types of applications where trying to figure out, okay, so case managers are building this from scratch. Every single agency is building this from scratch, be it dashboards, be it app, be it calculator, be it whatever it is. Um, so we're trying to figure out a way that we can reduce some of those agency administrative burdens. And so let's hold it as LASA as a system administrator, and then build those same type of applications or tweak them a tiny bit and have it so that everyone can use this one location. So everyone's looking at one source of truth. So we built out uh, several applications over the since I've been there. Um, and it's been really great. Um, sh- sure, some didn't work and we learned a <laughs> lot that's, through that's, that. That's product development. Man. Exactly. And then there's some that have been actually really substantially helpful within the community. Wow. There is, it's, it's so rich there. Um, so, so basically to kind of recap what you, what you've been able to do at LASA is you are creating digital products, whether it's web app or actually a mobile app to, to do two things. And you know, it sounds like you have two customers. So you, the one customer is similar to kind of, you're in the government space, but it's similar to a kind of a B2B where you're working with the admins across different agencies so that they can use your software, the things that you're developing to help better solve their problems and and centralize the information. Is there also kind of a a, a B to C angle? Is there, is there like boots on the ground? You're just actually agents in the streets that are also using the, the, the digital products that you're creating. Yeah, definitely. So the the biggest one that we developed recently is called the universal housing application. So this one, the universality, a universal housing, universal housing. Yeah. So this is a fully um, web-based integrated application that we, brought in information from a lot of our data systems that we have at LASA. We were able to um, auto-populate an application, build out an application online for housing resources for um, permanent supportive housing units, which is a resource that's available for clients that are experiencing homelessness that are very vulnerable, that really need that extra help for long-term care. Um, What is it, who would be someone who would be extra vulnerable? Would be kind of, if you to create like a a persona for for that extra vulnerable person what does it look like yeah so imagine you know probably a veteran that is dual diagnosed which we would consider having both chronic mental health and chronic physical health mm. um, uh, issues where it's very very difficult for that person to um, sustain by themselves you know it's okay. not impossible but it's very difficult yeah um, so these resources like PSH will help them with a uh, rehousing resource uh, that they can live in and attaches a supportive services attachment to them so they have consistent case management and intensive case management to really help them along within their housing journey till they become self-sustainable if they can that's amazing okay and so the tech that you're creating how does that factor in how where do you guys yeah you guys help? so at the time like um you know before this application you know clients would have to apply and apply and apply and the same type of questions over and over and over like and going over. to a doctor's office you felt the same form exactly. every single time exactly so like that's exactly what they lived and you know they would fill out application after application after application before they get housed um so the uha essentially um stores all of that information they only have to fill it in once and you know they upload all of their documents in this one centralized application and then it's a fully workflow um a fully functional workflow so as soon as they as case manager works with the client to submit it they press submit it gets sent to the building 
um, that they for permanent supportive housing resources. Right. They are able to review it. There's a whole quality assurance, like all built into it. There's a whole um, auditor type piece for their for their auditors to look at. <coughs> And then, um, and then once they're done reviewing it, they press approve, it goes to the PHA. So that's the public housing authority. So they're the final stamp of approval for their housing unit. So they would get a review it and they would check it and then boom, done. So that one application just saved the client probably several. So they don't have to consistently go back and fill it out and upload documents again and all that type of stuff get lost and lost within that system. I, I also imagine be some level of fatigue, right? I feel like if you apply twice, then you might get tired and you might give up. Um, especially if, if you're someone who's already, you know, in a vulnerable place, you may you may not have that drive or the the trust that the system's going to really pull for pull through for you. And so, by creating this in a digital form, you get to you let them just do it one time, and the system, the backend system, does the work for them. To if it if the first place doesn't work out, it goes to the next place and just keeps trying and trying. Totally, and it's adaptive too, because there may be some requirements for the first building that they got that they applied to that required you know X, Y, and Z documents to be filled out, and then the next the document, the next building that they um, applied for may have different requirements, and the application adjusts to those requirements. So that if the case manager needs to do, you know, one extra document because of this resource calls for it, they'll call it out within the document requirements and then they'll just upload it there. That's awesome. And, and you alluded to, you know, some of the challenges you faced in the earlier days of LASA where there wasn't as much funding. Um, what does it look like these days? I know I just kind of having read, kept up with the local news, there's been talk about additional funding to help with the LA housing issue. Um, how is that, is that impacting you guys yet? Or does it look like it's something that will impact you in a, the near or, you know, not too distant future? Oh yeah. So any new funding that comes down right, rather than from the federal, from, from HUD or from the state, or if it's local funding, um, it does impact LASA. Um, so we are like, we are the lead COC applicant. So a lot of the federal funding that comes for homelessness will come through LASA and the state we'll, you know, as the lead COC, they'll filter through the state. So it comes into LASA significantly. Um, when it comes to the technology piece of it, it's it's significantly impacting it. Now we mm -hmm. have a fantastic DCIO who is working with um, both internal um, staff and external staff to Dep really- Deputy deal. Chief Information Officer? Yeah. <laughs> to, um, <laughs> a lot of, to, it's government, so yeah, there's a lot of acronyms. Yeah, well, there's <laughs> so many acronyms in this field um, that we, uh, we are trying to expand the technology uh, scope within Los Angeles significantly in a way that it would both streamline a lot of the work that's happening right now. That's very manual um, in a way that it will help expedite a lot of the work that folks are working to get clients housed uh, way faster than uh, we're hoping to do or way faster than we are currently doing. That's amazing. And then what do you see in like the, let's call it the three to five year horizon for uh, is there even a, what's is there a term for it in tech? Is there is it like homeless tech or what is is, is there? Do you guys use something? You know, I don't know if there's a term for it. Um, I know uh, we you know I have a lot of folks within this field that are talking about you know where do we see the tech industry for social services or specifically housing and homelessness within the next five years. It's getting really exciting, like interoperability um, capabilities coming down the pipe, you know, expanding data lakes and all that type of stuff is trying to figure out a way that we can do some integration with a lot of our peers, I think is going to be a huge leap forward um, in the next five years. Are there any places you're looking for models, like similar, similar, not even not industries, but similar places where there were disparate companies who came together, disparate countries. Is there is there a model for what you guys are looking at? Or is that what you, or are you even looking at a model or is that something to, to think about? Yeah, definitely. So we so we brought in um, HUD technical assistance experts uh, to come and try to help us, try to understand, you know, what other communities are doing, what um, what, do, what can we do, and what can we shift and, you know, see, see if there's ways that we can expand this scope significantly more. Um, you know, when it comes to the tech space, though, and that's more so the programmatic, when it comes to the tech space, we are doing things like, you know, understanding metrics better. Mm. Um, you know, before it was like, oh, here's our system metrics and here are, you know, outcomes that we need to see. And we were putting them in contracts in, for like 
a year contract. And these are system outcomes and, and that would, we would probably see within a couple of years. Um, right. Now we're getting better at understanding what type of outputs and activities we need to be tracking for contracts and what types of resource allocation do we need to do associate to them and all that, all of those things is trying to expand our data literacy as mm. a, as a agency, but as a community. Um, to understand, you know, when these numbers say this, what does that mean? And what's the story behind it? Before it was never a story. Like it was always, it was always like, oh, this is, this is a number. You didn't hit the target. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but now we're trying to understand it a little bit more and find the why behind it, which has been a significant shift within the last five years. I mean, that's so, it's so important. I love that you describing the, the data literacy in terms of storytelling, because too many times I've seen dashboards, used in presentations and, and for evidence, but not really done justice or graphs being kind of thrown around, but it's really about that storytelling, explaining, you know, why is this data point important? Or how does it fit into the larger goal of this team or this project or this, whatever it is, a feature? Um, that's terrific. Yeah, that, that sounds Sounds like an exciting place for you guys to head. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of my uh, friends that are in other public um, uh, administrative offices doing the same type of thing, like they're expanding in this field too, which is really fantastic to see in the public administrative space to understand OKRs and understand sure, what yeah. you know, understand specific metrics and what do they mean and KPIs and all these different things and trying to figure out, okay, so how can we move performance? And that was my previous roles, like the performance manager, to really really understand what performance looks like. Uh, we also partnered with Harvard Government Performance Lab in a lot of this work and building out this model. Um, it's still active today and we're trying to understand, you know, how do we efficiently see performance on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, so we can move that needle further, so we can serve people faster, serve people more, get people in housing as fast as we possibly can. That's amazing. And if folks are listening to this and they want to help, is there something that they can do yeah, definitely. So if you're in Los Angeles County, um, we do an annual homeless count. You just missed it a little bit ago. You know, it was it was a lot of work for from a lot of folks to get that done. So every single year around January, uh, we will do a homeless count. And that's essentially where we go out and uh, count everyone um, that's experiencing homelessness. That alone, if you're able to help with that, hmm. will significantly impact, you know, uh, the community because that uh, those numbers determine funding allocations. So, um, so once we're able to do that, uh, that's a way to help. Also, we have so many fantastic nonprofits within the community that you could go out to well, do some volunteer work. They're always looking for volunteers and extra help. That's awesome. All right. Um, uh, can they also reach out to you on LinkedIn if, if they're interested in learning more? Yeah, most definitely. If you have uh, any interest around the homeless space, homeless tech space or anything like that, I'm more than happy to chat. That's awesome. Th thank you so much, Chris. And you know, it's, you're very based and very rooted in Los Angeles, but we always come back to that in this, on this podcast. Uh, love to learn, you know, what is the most LA thing that's happened to you that's tech related or not outside of the, the uh, daily attention you pay to the, the housing crisis and the, the homelessness issue, uh, which is, can't be understated. That, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, I love this question because it's, you know, a lot of, I've born and raised in LA, so everything yeah. is very, very much LA. Um, you know, a couple months, or a couple months back, last year, <laughs> goes by so fast, um, we went to the street food cinema um, in, uh, in the camp around UCLA. What's um, the street food cinema? So yeah, so every, every you, you could go on street food cinema and they do like a, a little pop-up movie theater of like your favorite movies. So you could go see like Wally or you could go see Star Wars, you could go see random things, whatever. Awesome. Um, but we went to go see Rocky Horror Picture Show. So I'm a huge geek and I love everything, you know, comic books and you know, sci-fi or whatever it is. So Rocky Horror was huge growing up. Um, yeah. so we saw that at the street food cinema, but the thing that makes it LA is not only is it a pop-up movie theater, essentially, <laughs> which is pretty, <laughs> that is pretty darn LA, but like there's food trucks everywhere. And if you're familiar with any type of convention or any type of event in LA, there's probably 20 food trucks that are fantastic, uh, yeah. to go out and get some food. So that, you know, and I'm a big foodie as well. So this place had, uh, Thai fusion, you know, it had uh, Mexican fusion, it had so many fusion places, and that's my go to. So I was <laughs> like, all right, so 
during <laughs> during uh you know time warp uh you know i went out oh, let's go get some meat there's three different trucks that i wanted to go to i went to every single one of them because i was like every single one has fantastic food i want to try it and you know in the middle of time warp people in cosplay all around in a pop-up movie theater. i think that's probably <laughs> one of the most la things that i've experienced that that is fantastic and that that is a great one to end on that, that's phenomenal chris um, want to thank you again, Christian A from the LA, uh, homeless services authority. I want to make sure I get that right. Yep. Thank you so much for, for sharing, uh, what you're doing over there and thank you for more importantly for doing it. It's, imp it's been so impressive to learn how people like you are using technology to help solve these real issues that are impacting people who need it. So thank you so much, Chris. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you very much. And also like to thank our sponsors, PMALA at PMA.LA and Uruit. You can find them at Uruit.com, U-R-U-I-T.com. I want to thank you all again for listening to us and uh, we'll catch you next time on Product in LA. 